first one says, I don't understand the difference between oneness and dissimilarity. So, <clears throat> all of the negative attributes are different dimensions of the same thing. Um, they have specific uh, emphasis that they indicate, but all of them are negations of what is not appropriate with regard to our conception of God. And all of them are <coughs> demonstrations of necessary being. That God is necessary being. He is utterly unlike his creation. And so how do we understand that? If we were able to comprehend the meaning of necessary being, there would be no need to say anything else. So all of these negative attributes, in a way, are different dimensions of the same thing. And therefore, God's oneness is one of the most emphatic expressions of his dissimilarity. Because nothing in this creation is one in that way. This is one cup, but that's two, and that's three, and that's four. Okay? And everything that is in creation is in reality or in a potential a manifestation of multiplicities, infinite multiplicities. So when we say that God is one, we are emphasizing that he is utterly dissimilar. And we are also emphasizing that he is utterly self-sufficient. Because the nature of this oneness also is that it is manifest power, just like his self-sufficiency also manifests power. He who needs nothing can give you everything. He who has needs nothing has no honor. There is no difficulty with regard to him. So if you do tasbih, he can create for you a tree in paradise. If you do a good deed, he can create for you a palace in paradise. These are not stories just to be told to children so that they will be pious. These are absolute realities. Okay, so the oneness of God is an ultimate expression of his dissimilarity. And this is why also when we talk about oneness, we do not grasp what it means. I have to say that one of the necessary implications of oneness of God is that he's not made up of parts. You know, this cup and everything in the world around me is made up of atoms and molecules and parts, and they're ordered. And I, by experience, cannot imagine anything existing that is not like that, but he is not like that. And his oneness declares that he's not like that. Okay, and it doesn't mean, and again, we have to liberate ourselves from the illusion of drawing analogies with created being. Because when we describe God by these attributes, no beginning, no end, no cause, nothing that designates the way he is, but to, sp to speak like that about people who only understand the realm of possible being is as if you're talking about something that doesn't exist. Whereas in reality, you are talking about the one who does exist, and whose existence is haq, and who is the real. Okay, so this is why also we ask Allah always, when we take this knowledge, that he expands our heart. And we also ask Allah that we are able to lead a life in which we pray five times a day, and in which we purify ourselves and in which we eat what is halal, and we avoid what is haram, and we fast in Ramadan. When we do that, then we can receive this, and we can hold this knowledge. And this is why also when Allah wills to guide a person to Islam, يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ Islam, He expands their heart, because the truth is huge. And then... They can take it in. And then we live a way of life that makes it real. This deen is amazing. 
You know, I grew up as a Christian. And uh, we were Christians who loved Jesus Christ. And we took the church very seriously. And I memorized everything in the church. I knew the catechism of the church by memory. My mother could open up the catechism and ask me a question, and I could tell her the answer. And, um, you know, but all the time that I was in the church, I was an acolyte, I wore special clothes, I served the preacher, and so forth, I would go back to the back of the church and sit with my father. He always sat in the back row. I would go there, and I'd come back to the front to finish the services, and I always felt empty. That's the truth. I always felt this pain in my heart, you know, that I am not being fulfilled. That the, the priest, the pastor, he's doing all the worship. I'm not doing it. Even though I kneel, I sing, I pray, but I always felt empty, even at 10 years old, 11 and 12 years old. And then when I was 16, I left the religion. And I didn't come back to belief until I was like 21, 22. That's when Allah brought me to Islam. But when I came to Islam, you know, and then I was taught to pray, and I made sajda for the first time, even though it's very difficult, very painful, because your body's not, yeah, how can I sit on the floor? It, it burns my legs. Like I sat in chairs all my life. Now I've got to sit on the floor. It's like it was so painful. You know, but the first sajda, it's like all that emptiness is gone. It's like, it's like, I don't want to even come up from the center. It's like, now my heart is fulfilled. You know, so, um, you know, this religion that we have is really <coughs> powerful. And it gives you the ability to take in this knowledge and to hold this knowledge. That's why, again, sharia and haqiqah. You know, this is a huge haqiqah. So we have to have the sharia. We have to live that life. And may Allah enable us to do that with great ease and great wisdom and great beauty.